Good morning, Sanctuary. I sure do miss getting to see everybody, but I hope everybody's doing okay. Um, this morning, we're going to read from Acts chapter 13, and we will be talking about the church on the move. So if you have your Bibles, go ahead and turn to Acts chapter 13. It's been almost a year. Actually, it was May 19th of 2019 to be exact when we started this series through the book of Acts called an Acts to Grind and within the first few weeks of this series we shared a four-part sermon entitled the church set in motion in today's text we will see that even though a few years have passed and the church is still on the move in fact it's just getting started let's pray together Lord, I thank you so much for this beautiful day that you've given us. Lord, I just ask that you speak to us through your word. And Lord, that we would see how we too, as the sanctuary, can also be a church on the move for your glory. And we ask you to just have your way during this time. In Jesus' name, amen. You can see over my shoulder uh, that I am on a U-Haul truck lot and you might be wondering why am I why in the world would I be uh, talking about U-Hauls this morning well <clears throat> this week I actually spent a quite a bit of time um, on a U-Haul truck I've been helping my oldest son Andrew move from Canton Ohio to Ashland Ohio he's got a lot going on as he's getting ready to start a new phase of life for starters, <clears throat> he's graduating from Malone University. You know, he's worked so hard to get to this point in his life, and I'm really so so proud of everything that he's already accomplished, and can't wait to see what he's uh, what God's yet to do in his life. In addition to that, he's getting married very soon, within actually next weekend, I believe it is. Um, God has blessed him with a younger, younger, wonderful young lady named Allie. And she comes from a wonderful family. And I'm so excited for the both of them as they start out on this journey through life together. You know, this coronavirus has really interfered with their plans uh, for their wedding and everything. And so they've moved up their date. They're going to be getting married uh, next weekend. Um, and, and that's great news. He's graduated. He's getting married. Some wonderful things. But I, I got to tell you, as a dad, I think the thing that I'm most excited about is that he's got a job. That's right. He's moving to Ashland to begin his career with Young Life. And Young Life, as, as many of you know or are familiar with, um, Young Life is a ministry that's committed to going where kids are and winning the right to be heard and then sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ with young people. So as any typical parent, I'm really proud of my son. I'm excited for him and as he enters this next phase of life. But again, as any typical parent, I'm also a little nervous and worried because even though he has enjoyed a bit of independence for the last four years at college, now he's really becoming his own man and just becoming completely independent. As any parent knows, it's a scary world to send your kids into, even if they are adults. I just want Andrew to be healthy and happy, safe and secure in all that he does. And so I'm sure that Andrew and quite honestly his dad would appreciate your prayers for him, his marriage and his ministry. But that's enough about Andrew's move. Today we're talking about the church on the move. There's three characteristics that we can draw from our text today in Acts chapter 13. The first characteristic I want us to think about is that the church on the move is fully equipped. And so let's look at Acts chapter 13 verses 1 through 3. It says, Now in the church at Antioch there were prophets and teachers, Barnabas called Simeon, I'm sorry, Barnabas, and then there was Simeon called Niger, then there was Lucius of Cyrene, Manaen, who had been brought up with Herod the Tetrarch, and Saul. 
While they were worshiping the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, Set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. So after they had fasted and prayed, they placed their hands on them and sent them off. Now there's a couple of things about the church on the move being fully equipped. We see in verse 1 that there were a couple of the spiritual gifts that were mentioned in verse 1. It says um, the leaders in the church of Antioch, there were prophets and there were teachers. Any church on the move is going to be fully equipped with members, with people in the church who have spiritual gifts. Obviously, prophets and teachers are two that are specifically mentioned by these verses, but it's reasonable to assume that there were other people in the church practicing other spiritual gifts as well. Romans chapter 12 and 1 Corinthians chapter 12 give us a list of some of the spiritual gifts. When we look at those, we see that there are prophecy and teaching that are included there. But some of the other important spiritual gifts that are mentioned are administration, serving, exhortation, mercy, giving. Uh, I'm not sure if I'm, I'm sure there's more that I'm, I'm missing, but the bottom line is that we all have a spiritual gift. Everybody has a spiritual gift, and it's everyone's responsibility to share their spiritual gift for the building up of the church and serving one another. Um, we also see that they were practicing spiritual disciplines. Verse 2 says, while they were worshiping the Lord and fasting. Now, we think about the spiritual disciplines, uh, the two that are mentioned here, worshiping the Lord and fasting. During the process or, or during the, the course of their worship, they were engaged in reading scripture. They didn't have the New Testament like we do. But they had the prophets, they had the law, they had the history of Israel. A lot of the Old Testament scriptures that they had, they read scripture to learn about God and to help them grow in their faith. They prayed, obviously. A lot of times in scripture, uh, as we read about praying, it's usually a lot of times associated with fasting. And these, this verse says that they were fasting as well. While they were worshiping the Lord, and fasting, verse 2 says. And so praying and fasting are two of those spiritual disciplines. Apparently they were gathering together as the church. And that's another discipline. Fellowship, fellowshipping with other believers. And uh, so those, those spiritual disciplines were being practiced. They were exercising those spiritual disciplines. And when it comes to a church on the move, being equipped, employing spiritual gifts and exercising uh, spiritual discipline. Second Timothy chapter 3 verse 16 to 17. It really kind of puts it all together for us. It says all scripture is God breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness so that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. Every follower of Christ has a role to play in the advancement of his kingdom. And we're all equipped with spiritual gifts and we've been given the disciplines that we can nurture and develop in our lives. And when we're all engaged, our church is fully equipped and that is when we best see the church on the move. Second characteristic about a church on the move is that it's focused on evangelism. It's focused on evangelism. Look in verse 4 with me. The two of them, that's Barnabas and Saul, they were sent on their way by the Holy Spirit. And they went down to Seleucia and sailed from there to Cyprus. When they arrived at Salamis, they proclaimed the word of God in the Jewish synagogues. John was with them as their helper. Now there's two, uh, a two-pronged approach when it comes to being focused on evangelism. There is an eternal, I'm sorry, in, internal uh, focus. The, we, when we think of internally sharing our faith and, and being engaged in evangelism internally, I mean, what I mean by that is 
sharing with those who are in our own country or from our own culture, those that we can easily relate to, maybe family, maybe neighbors, uh, co-workers, those who are that we can easily relate to because we share culture. And we live in the same geographic location. Um, we think about the Great Commission where they started in their immediate location in Jerusalem. And then they spread out to Judea, which surrounded Jerusalem, but definitely shared the same culture. Then they moved out to Samaria and ultimately the uttermost parts of the world. And that's what this whole trip is about when Barnabas and Saul are uh, departing on their first missionary journey. But even in the uttermost parts of the world, Barnabas and Saul went to the synagogues first to minister to those from the Jewish culture. We at the sanctuary, we've reflected that internal evangelistic focus of a church on the move by calling in one another to check, check on each other just to make sure that everybody's doing okay. Sometimes we've run errands for one another, uh, maybe sharing meals together during this time of crisis. There's so many different ways that internally we've been able to uh, have a focus, evangelistic focus. But there was also in, in the early church, and this is really relates more to Barnabas and Saul, the external focus and the whole purpose of their trip, their journey. And really here we're talking about missions. Those in other countries or those from other cultures that we can share the gospel with. Look at verse 6. It says, They, that's Barnabas and Saul, they traveled through the whole island until they came to Paphos. And there they met a Jewish sorcerer and false prophet named Bar-Jesus, who was an attendant to the proconsul Sergius Paulus. And the proconsul, an intelligent man, sent for Barnabas and Saul because he wanted to hear the word of God. Now verse 7 tells us that Sergius Paulus, the proconsul, was interested in hearing the word of God. And I think if we were willing to be a little bit bolder in our evangelism, but especially if we're willing to step outside of our comfort zones, we'd be surprised by how many people would be interested in hearing the word of God. John chapter 4 verse 35 says, I tell you, open your eyes and look at the fields. They are ripe for harvest. That's what Jesus says. He was talking to his disciples and I think his message is relevant for us as well. If we're going to have an evangelistic focus and if we're going to be a church on the move, we need to do some things that are going to help us move along. We need to strategically place ourselves in locations and situations that allow us the greatest chance to encounter someone who is interested in the gospel. We need to foster sensitivity within our heart towards those who have open hearts. A lot of times we want to just kick down the doors of the hearts of those that we know because we just want to, to tie them up and drag them into the kingdom of God. And a lot of times we're just completely oblivious to someone that we may not know, someone we may be a little different from, but, but they may have a completely open heart to the gospel. And we need to foster that sensitivity toward others with open hearts. Most of all, we need to be led by the Holy Spirit. And you see in these verses over and over again, we see that Paul and Barnabas were led by the Holy Spirit. You know, at the sanctuary, we have reflected the external evangelistic focus of the church on the move by partnering with other service and mission organizations to reach the world with the gospel of Christ. Most recently, we prepared a meal for the homeless at Crossroads to show them God's love. You know, without any evangelistic focus and without a mission mindset, we'll never truly be a church on the move. The third characteristic that I want us to, to, to focus in on is that the church on the move faces opposition. Look at verse 8 with me. It says, But Elymas, the sorcerer, for that is what his name means, opposed them and tried to turn the proconsul from the faith. Earlier he was referred to as Bar-Jesus, 
and now we see that his name was Elymas. And there's a lot of speculation in the reading that I did and research that the Bar Jesus name might have been an attempt by him just to uh, claim authority, appeal to Jesus' authority. Uh, Jesus' name probably was pretty popular even uh, during that time. Jesus had recently, within the last few years, been crucified and he had caused quite a stir. And so uh, maybe Elymas had borrowed his name, Bar Jesus, as a part of his name. Uh, Bar Jesus means son of Jesus, and maybe he was just trying to gain some kind of credibility. Either way, some of us may feel like um, the church is being attacked right now, being opposed. Some feel like the church is facing opposition greater than it's ever faced. But you know what? The reality is the church has always been under attack. In fact, the church in America today has it pretty easy compared, compared to the early church. You know, back then they were threatened with being jailed and even put to death, but it never slowed them down. Today, we're more worried that we, we might offend someone. Someone might not like what we have to say about Jesus. So we just shrink away and we don't say anything. But verses 9 through 11 in our text today teaches our fourth characteristic of the church. And that is that the church on the move is a force to be reckoned with. Look in verse 9 with me. It says, Then Saul, who was called Paul, filled with the Holy Spirit, looked straight at Elymas and said, You are the ch a child of the devil and an enemy of everything that is right. You are full of all kinds of deceit and trickery. You'll never stop perverting the right, or will you ever stop perverting the right ways of the Lord? Now the hand of the Lord is against you. You're going to be blind for a time, not even able to see the light of the sun. And immediately mist and darkness came over him, and he groped about seeking someone to, to lead him by the hand. Notice that Saul didn't do anything on his own. You know, I'm sure Saul was frustrated, maybe even a little bit angry toward Elymas because of his opposition. But Saul didn't retaliate out of anger or frustration. Verse 9 says he was filled with the Spirit. And if we really stop and think about it, we might even realize that Saul could have possibly had a little bit of sympathy for Elymas because Saul, even though he was bold, in his confrontation with Elymas and his condemnation of Elymas' uh, behavior, he could possibly sympathize with Elymas because Saul experienced blindness as he persecuted God, as he opposed the church. He, he experienced blindness on the road to Damascus. He understood exactly what Elymas was going through. He understood exactly what God was doing to Elymas. So Paul had been in, in Elymas' shoes, and he could, he could sympathize with what Elymas was going through. Yet, he was bold in his, in his response to Elymas' opposition. And I want us to kind of just, I, I think verse 12 is such a good verse to end on today, because it pretty much sums up that even though the church may face opposition, it's still a force to be reckoned with. Look at verse 12. It says, When the proconsul saw what had happened, he believed, for he was amazed at the teaching about the Lord. You know, I think there's a couple of things in that verse I want to talk about there. The proconsul saw what happened. It's one thing to be able to see some miraculous things. Uh, Elemis being struck blind. That yeah, that's pretty intimidating stuff, and it's definitely going to make me cause, uh, pause and think about the claims of the gospel, the claims of, of God. But more, it says that it says that the proconsul was amazed at the teaching about the Lord. He did get a chance to hear from Barnabas and Saul and what they had to say about about God about what the Old Testament already said about God and how 
all of that had been filled, fulfilled in Jesus Christ. He was amazed at the teaching about the Lord. You know, as a church on the move, we strive to be fully equipped, employing our spiritual gifts and exercising our spiritual disciplines. And it takes all of us doing our part. As a church on the move, we focus on evangelism to those in our own country and in our own culture and to those in other countries and other cultures. We have to be willing to reach out internally and externally. As a church on the move, we face opposition with confidence and hope because we have a wonderful, powerful Savior behind us. And as a church on the move, we are a force to be reckoned with. We're, we're empowered by God to join Him in the work of advancing His kingdom. Let's pray together. Lord, again, I thank You for Your Word. And I thank you for the power that you've given us to live lives representing you. Lord, it's not power that comes from us. It's power that comes from you. And Lord, we just pray that you would help us to, to boldly proclaim the gospel. To, Lord, just have an outward focus, uh, an evangelistic focus to be the church on the move and be relevant in our world around us. And God, we just thank you again for your word. And we love you in Jesus' name. Amen. I pray that you have a great week. And I look forward to seeing you again soon. God bless.